Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Of David, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. This is the word of the Lord. Well, our summer series through the Psalms is coming to clo a close today, and as Brother Jason helpfully told me, it's a win-win situation, because either we'll go out with a bang, or people will be really glad that we're back in Mark. So that was, that was helpful for me, eased a lot of the anxieties. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for Jesus, who redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For we are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which you prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Help us to worship you with all we are, to know the great calling you have on every life in this room. Your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Holy Spirit, do your work amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to leave this place compelled today, inspired and, and eager to expose lies by living the truth and proclaiming the truth. As we consider the state of man that we see in Psalm 14, may we be compelled to know truth so that, so that we are impervious to the spirit of the age and to its deceit. May we be further compelled to be so joyful in Christ, and so eager for others to share our joy that we overflow with love and kindness, truth and mercy. We must do this. And I think this is the call of Psalm 14 when, re when read by us who know the victory and call of Jesus. I, I want to tell you about a man named Rene There de la Villache. He probably doesn't mean anything to you, and you probably don't realize how long it took for me to be able to pronounce his name, but it was a lot. Well, so De, De La Villache, he was a French aristocrat and a money manager. He's very successful. Historic and influential families across Europe entrusted him with their wealth to manage and invest, and he was good at it. Uh, in total, his firm managed about $1.5 billion for his clients, and he would identify and analyze his places to invest and grow that money. So kids, let me explain investing to you. So imagine I told you I had a, a great lemonade stand idea, but I just needed some money to buy lemons. So if you will give me $50, if you invest $50 with me, I will go buy lemons, make lemonade, sell it, and make more money. The money I make is called profit. And then I will share it with you. So all goes well, and I will return to you your $50 plus an additional $50. Your 50 has become 100 so, so that is essentially what is happening here, except with billions of dollars. To this end, De La Villache had cultivated a relationship with a brilliant fund manager, a guy who would have a strategy that produced excellent returns, while at the same time incurring very few losses. And I'm about to give you the secret to this fund manager's success. So are you ready? Okay. So he would take billions and billions of dollars that was invested. He would put it into a bank account, and then he would do nothing with it. He just let it sit there. He wouldn't actually invest it, but he would pretend to invest it. He would even create fake statements 
making it appear that there were many smart investments and excellent returns, none of which were actually made. But the fake documentation did make for very happy clients who then wanted to invest more and more and more and rarely asked to withdraw funds. This classic type of fraud is called a Ponzi scheme, and it is what Bernie Madoff did for decades. The money that De La Villache and others thought Bernie Madoff was investing for them was actually being used by Madoff to fund his own extravagant lifestyle and to further perpetuate the fraud. When it finally collapsed in 2008, Madoff's fraud had totaled nearly $65 billion. $65 billion. You see, Bernie Madoff was brilliant, but his brilliance was not so much his understanding of the markets and investments, but it was his understanding of human nature. He had a very keen sense of how the human heart and mind operated. Madoff's scheme was and remains the largest financial fraud in the history of the world. Yet it is nothing compared to another fraud that is ongoing as we speak. Right this moment, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our families, in this very room, the heart of every man, woman, and child is attempting to perpetrate a fraud that will make Bernie Madoff's $65 billion theft look like a child sneaking a cookie. So what is this fraud? Let's look at Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. This is the great fraud. The corrupt heart of fallen man constructs and declares the deadly lie that there is no God. Every human heart has perpetuated and completely believed the lie, either explicitly with words or implicitly by sinful actions. The depth and wickedness of constructing and submitting to this lie cannot be overstated. And the overflow of the love of the Trinity between the Father and the Son in the Spirit, the world was created. We were made in God's image to reflect and to spread the love, to spread the love of the Father and the Son in the Spirit. Having been so blessed and so commissioned, great joy was available to us to experience and spread his love. Yet our hearts fixated on the fruit of the one tree that is not for us. We determined to be like God rather than love him. Rather than submit to God's gentle and wise hand, we determined to deceive ourselves into believing that we and our desires are paramount. And so our foolish hearts devised the great fraud and declared God nothing. We minimize his authority, we disregard his word, we reject his son so that we can live lives that revolve around and ever seek to gratify our sinful desires. Bernie Madoff sought your money. The great fraud seeks to consume souls, and it is unrelenting. So we must be able to recognize the tactics of the fraud. We must understand how one is rescued from it. We must understand that Christians, that we who have been freed from bondage, we must understand what, what we must now do to guard against deceit and call others to freedom. Psalm 14 exposes the great fraud, and we'll journey through it in four parts. Part one, corrupt man deceives. Part two, merciful God redeems. Part three, redeemed man rehearses the gospel. And part four, redeemed man proclaims the gospel. Corrupt man deceives. Merciful God redeems. Redeemed man rehearses the gospel. Redeemed man proclaims the gospel. It's part one, corrupt man deceives. Who is the perpetrator? The Bernie Madoff of the great fraud was the human heart. Every single human heart. Look at verse two, verses two and three. The 
The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Not even one. Once we turned from God, we became utterly corrupt. And in our fallen state, there is not a single human that does good. Not one that loves God, that submits to his kind rule, that is thankful, that worships him. Not a one. Flip forward in your Bible with me to, to Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul's letter, we'll, we'll be flipping back and forth between Romans and Psalms, so you might put a pen or something in it. Now here Paul pulls from Psalm 14. We'll be in chapter 3 as he builds the case explaining the utter corruption of mankind. I'm going to read verses 9 through 18 of chapter 3. Uh, Paul has just explained the status of the Jews and how they had certain advantages, such as being entrusted with the oracles of God. And now he'll answer the question, well then, are they any better off? So, so verse 9, chapter 3. What then? Are, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together, they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Not even one. Paul continues piling on now, just showing how corrupt we are in this sinful state. Verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their path, in their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And then he sums it up in verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what is the status of sinful man? Well, corrupt to our very core. Recall verse 1 of Psalm 14. We say in our heart, in our heart, there is no God. The heart is our core, the center of our being. In our fallen state, we are corrupt to our core, incapable of doing good. We do not even seek God nor fear him. And why not? Because we've exchanged that truth of God for a lie, the great fraud. And we have become completely corrupted in the process. As God describes us in Ephesians 2, we are spiritually dead. This is the fallen nature of mankind, sometimes called original sin or total depravity. Now, total depravity does not mean that humans are utterly depraved or as wicked as we possibly could be. There is common grace yet restraining us. Uh, R.C. Sproul is helpful here. He writes, Total depravity means that the fall was so serious that it affects the whole person. The fallenness that captures and grips our human nature affects our bodies. That's why we become ill and die. It affects our minds and our thinking. We still have the capacity to think, but the Bible says the mind has become darkened and weakened. The will of man is no longer in its pristine state of moral power. The will, according to the New Testament, is now in bondage. We are enslaved to the evil impulses and desires of our hearts. The body, the mind, the will, the spirit, indeed the whole person have been infected by the power of sin. To help our minds grapple with this, Sproul helpfully recommends replacing the phrase total depravity with radical corruption. He goes on to say, the word radical has its root in the Latin word radix, which can be translated root or core. The term radical has to do with something that permeates to the core of a thing. It's not something that is tangential or superficial, lying on the surface. Moreover, the Latin word from which we get the word core also means heart. That is, our sin is something that comes from our hearts. In biblical terms, that means it's from the core or very center of our existence. Okay, so corruption goes to our very core. We have exchanged God for our own self-centered existence. We have completely bought in to the great fraud. And as spiritually dead, we have no eyes to see the fraud for what it is. So what hope is there? Well, we need a new core. We need a new essence. We need a new heart. Which brings us to part two. Merciful God redeems. So if all have turned aside and all are corrupt, 
to their core, then why are you here? Why do you call Jesus Lord if you do? Why do you pursue him? Why do you love him? Let's go back to chapter 3 of Romans. Paul explained our dire situation, and in verse 23, makes clear that there is no, no distinction between Jew and Greek. We'll pick it up again in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. In response to us rebelliously constructing the lie, what does God do? He breaks the power of the lie. He gives us a new heart. He frees us from the prison we constructed. He does it all. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 1 Peter 1. We are spiritually dead and therefore must be born anew, born with a new nature, a new heart, a new core. And so God reaches into the deepest part of you and rips out your rotten, corrupt heart. And in its place, he puts a new heart, a new core, a new essence, one that seeks God, that loves God, that loves Jesus. Yes, there will be remaining sin, but it is not the core of you any longer. Sin was your essence, but now it is a nuisance. It was your identity, but now it is a mere virus, a virus that may indeed attack your healthy heart and must be battled, but it is no longer who you are. Turn to Jesus in repentance and faith. Make Jesus your treasure. Turn from sin and declare, I want to follow you, Lord. Do it every day. But what about the penalty for all the deceit and self-centeredness? The punishment for a life of rebellion? What good is our new heart if looming eternal judgment dangles above our necks like a guillotine? Well, Bernie Madoff was sentenced to 150 years in prison for his crimes. But the rebellious perpetrator of the great fraud will face an eternity completely separated from God and his grace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Imagine your moments of greatest despair, of greatest confusion, of greatest sorrow, of greatest pain, your moments of most disgusting vileness, selfishness, and anger. Then multiply that by 65 billion, and then you will begin to fathom what an eternity separated from God will entail. Consider the wickedness of man, the hate, the pain, and then remind yourself that God's grace, God's common grace is yet restraining that evil. We are getting a mere taste, a tiny taste of what corrupt man is capable of. Try to imagine it completely unrestrained. This is a glimpse of what justly awaits fallen man, a life completely absent the grace of God. So what happens? What happens to this due penalty owed to us? Us who lived and perpetuated the great fraud, are these transgressions just swept under the rug? Is a blind eye turned? What would the thousands of victims of Bernie Madoff's fraud, what would they have said if the judge were simply to slap Bernie on the wrist and release him? No, God cannot sweep away the penalty. It, it would be a violation of his character. He is just. He is righteous. He is good. The penalty must be satisfied. And so Jesus, who knew your name before the foundation of the world, stepped forward as your propitiator and the propitiation, the satisfier and the satisfaction. He would satisfy your penalty himself. And so he takes it on. Every ounce of your sin, of your rebellion, of your complicity in the great fraud, he actually took it on. In reality, this happened if you are in Christ. This is not a mere idea or an illustration. It is truth. Every single one of your sins, past, present, and future, you specifically, he had in mind. Your sins specifically, each and every one of them, even the ones you try to push the deepest part of your soul, he knows them and he took them on. 
He became them. And then, taking his place on a Roman cross, the rough wood and splinters grinding against his bare body, Jesus spreads his arms as far as the east is from the west, and then he allowed the nails to be driven. Blow after blow, as your every sin is nailed, it's nailed to the tree. And then the cross is lifted high, and the wrath of God is satisfied. It is propitiated as Jesus, who has eternally dwelt in perfect harmony with the Father, is now forsaken, separated from the Father for the first time ever. As the Father now looks upon his Son, hanging on the cross, he sees only your sin. And then every ounce of the penalty due you is poured out on Jesus. And so the penalty is satisfied once and for all. He was your substitute. It's done. It is complete. It is finished. Your sins are no more because Jesus' work was complete. He loved you unto death. And on the third day, Jesus broke the chains of death as we will soon sing together. In the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good, for the lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born. Then the spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom, I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Part three, redeemed man rehearses the gospel. Back to Psalm 14, verses four through six. <clears throat> Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Corrupt man is devouring and shaming God's redeemed. They eat up the people of God. They are devouring them, shaming them. The world is not happy that you have abandoned the great fraud. It makes them feel uneasy. So they will always seek to pull you back in. Though we are redeemed, Though we are a new creation, we still sin. We still have lingering sin. What is more, unredeemed man seeks to devour us and shame us. The world sprinkles seeds of doubt all around, all around your new heart. And if you are not vigilant to identify weeds of sin and doubt, if, you are, if you're not aggressively tearing out those weeds as they take root, well, you can eventually be covered by them. And even though your core, your heart is new, it can feel as if you're choking, that the weeds surround you and feel lost or confused. So in, in order to effectively do spiritual weeding, we must do two things. Uh, first is recognize the weeds. And second, and most important, is know the flower, know the truth. In recognizing the weeds, we become familiar with the tactics of those who seek to perpetuate the great fraud, those who are sprinkling those seeds of doubt all around your new heart, those people who are still blinded and whose hearts are still submitted to this fraud. They have very much at stake, and they will fight with all they have to support the fraud, to find evidence for why they can have confidence in it, and to try to compel you to acknowledge the validity of their evidence. A fraud is a confidence game. A fraudster succeeds by gaining confidence of his victims, by gaining such level of confidence that any contrary evidence or warnings get drowned out. I've had the joy of doing one-to-one -one Bible reading with uh, who's become my good friend, Jonathan Morris. And we, we get together every other, every other week at Chick-fil-A. We've been reading through First and Second Timothy, and we read a chapter out loud and we talk about it. And we just wrapped up this last Wednesday, 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4. And he's reading chapter 4, and it's got a lot of names in it. If you've read biblical names, it's not like Joe and Pete and Bob. These are, there's like seven or eight of them. And every time I'm, he's reading aloud, and I'm like, oh, he's going to trip up on this one. And he never did. He just, he goes through without skipping a beat. He nails every single one. And I'm like, dang, 
are you practicing that? What's, he, he, said, he said, you know, if you say anything confidently enough, anyone will believe it's correct. And that is true. And that's how frauds can work. People around you are saying things so confidently that sometimes you're like, See, maybe I'm wrong. There were many warning signs that Bernie Madoff was perpetuating a fraud, but he, he created the intellectual cover for people. In fact, almost 10 years before it collapsed, a financial analyst named Harry Markopoulos had realized, had mathematically proven that Bernie Madoff was perpetuating the fraud 10 years before it collapsed. So he and his colleague, Frank Casey, sounded the alarm. They made submissions to the Securities and Exchange Commission, to the press, to investors. Harry and Frank had a personal relationship with Thierry de la Villache, and they implored him and others to see the fraud for what it was. They were shouting it from the rooftops for nearly 10 years, but no one listened. You see, no one wanted it to be true. They were able to compile plenty of ways to convince themselves that there was no fraud. And Madoff's fraud and the great fraud share much in common in this regard. Bernie Madoff was too influential and credible to be involved in something like this. He was chairman of the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. He sat on SEC advisory committees. He was on the short list to be the next chairman of the SEC. People would lean on their documentation. We have statements, documentation showing the trades. We have documentary evidence. We've hired investigators. We have experts who have looked at this man. They're smarter than us. Their opinions are legitimate. They say it's all good. And here we have in Psalm 14, the psalmist shouting from the rooftop, the corrupt heart of man has fallen for the great fraud. But no one wants to listen because they are so invested in the fraud, so given over to it, that they are blind. Like Madoff's fraud, the great fraud likewise has its flimsy evidence to give comfort to its victims. Lists of experts and people of influence whose theories are presented as fact. It has its so-called scientists who say this is all a cosmic accident and there is no design. It has its spiritual and psychological gurus preaching self-actualization and that you and your feelings are the center of the universe. And as such, ultimate truth is whatever you say it is. They have their documents, their textbooks, and well-presented theories masquerading as reality, giving an air of authenticity. You see, they say, there was a big bang when a dense single point expanded over billions of years and became what we have today. No design, just an accident. It's like me pointing to a new Tesla and saying to you, looks like a junkyard exploded and the result was at their car. That's insane, you say. Obviously, that car was designed and built. No, 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 no. It's a junkyard explosion. I read it in a book, and it took billions of years, so that's why you can't comprehend it and why I don't have to prove it. Also, this banana and you are basically the same thing. You just evolved differently. But again, it was billions of years ago, so that's why you can't comprehend it. Darwin's theory of evolution is one of the prized possessions of the purveyor of the great fraud. It makes them feel there's a foothold for their belief that there is no God. And it reminds me of something that happened to me in the fourth grade, which I think has a good lesson for us and will transition well to my second point. Uh, so here I am, getting ready to head off for the first day of fourth grade at Sioux Trail Elementary School. My parents are aware of the climate. They are aware that public schools are a place where the great fraud is active and well, where seeds of doubt are scattered generously and cultivated earnestly. And so they say to me, if any of your teachers ever talk about evolution, you need to tell us. Okay, I said. Not really knowing what this was at all, but just knowing it sounded pretty serious, and I sure hoped I wouldn't have to face this challenge. So I take the bus to school, I get to my new classroom, I'm sitting at my new desk, and I look up at the board, and I see the agenda for the day, and it's an introduction, reading, math, science. I look down, I see at the bottom, evolution. 
and I tense up. I'm, I'm not sure what to do. Should I try to get away? Should I pretend I'm sick? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what to do here. Should I tell someone? So as the, drain day, the day drains away, my, my dread slowly rises. And, and so we're standing in line to head to recess or something, and I, I look up at Mr. Bedard, and I say, Mr. Bedard, what is evolution? And Mr. Bedard pauses, and then he says, I think you should ask your parents about that. To which I say, but it says it up there on the board. And Mr. Bedard turns, and he looks, and he looks back at me, and he says, that says evaluation. <laughs> well, but my, my great relief far surpassed my embarrassment, but this experience has some learnings for us. Parents, talk to your children about the great fraud. My parents did well to warn me. They may even have explained it to me. I'm not sure. Um, maybe I wasn't paying attention. But not all teachers will be as noble as Mr. Bedard, pointing the child back to their parents. Many will see an opportunity for indoctrination. Kids, be prepared to face the great fraud at every turn. Just because someone in authority says something doesn't make it true. Just because they are confident and smart-sounding, it does not make it true. You need not be in terror, like I was. You can even sit politely and listen, then go back and search the scriptures for yourself. Talk to your parents. And here's the most important takeaway, and is the second thing you must do in order to effectively do spiritual weeding. The first was to recognize the weeds, the tactics of the great fraud, and the second, that's, this is really what's essential. The first is, prime, or is secondary. What is most critical is that you know the truth, that you know the flower. If you intimately know the flower, no weed will deceive you. If you know scripture, if you know God, the tactics of the world will never ensnare you because you are anchored in truth. This is a commonly told illustration, but I find it helpful, so I'll repeat it. But the way to detect counterfeit money is not to study counterfeits. There are countless variations and new attempts at a counterfeit every day. The way to detect a counterfeit is by studying the authentic. If one knows an authentic bill, in and out, whatever version of counterfeit is placed before them, it will, seem, it will be readily seen for a fraud. Brothers and sisters, it is not imperative that you know and understand all the lies and tactics of the world. It is imperative that you know and understand the truth, that you continually rehearse the gospel, that you soak yourself daily in the word so that you can see and extinguish the flaming darts shot at you. Part four. Look again at verses four through six. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? They are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Corrupt man is utterly consumed by the great fraud. Have they no knowledge? And yet, they are in great terror because they know deep down that God is. And here you stand as one who was lost but now is found. You were dead but have been given newness of life. You were running headlong towards an eternity of despair and wickedness unimaginable. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved you, made you alive together with Christ because of the great love with which he loved you came for you. He grabbed you from the wide road that leads to destruction. He gave you a new heart and with it a new purpose, a new calling. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. We have the joy to walk in them. May we run in them where we previously invested our souls in the great fraud, now let's invest our everything in the cause of Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, 
Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Brothers and sisters, you are commissioned. You are sent. You're sent to the broken and the lost. May we invest ourselves in this. May the redeemed of the Lord proclaim the rescue of Jesus. To be sure, Jesus does not need you in order to save the lost, but he is offering you the joy and privilege of being a part of it. To be part of the rejoicing in heaven when the prodigal comes home. We are all called to this, but it can be overwhelming. So I want to give us four quick helps, a little more practical, and then we'll close. Uh, first, pebble evangelism. I once had a friend named Kevin McClure who told me that often the goal of our evangelism should be just to put a pebble in someone's shoe, something that makes them think. It stays with them. It slow, slowly disquiets them. It bothers them until God brings the next person into their path. God will very often work in this way, where a sinner's shoe is filled with pebbles from various sources along the way. And then, right at the right time, God brings in someone totally disconnected to help the person deal with the disquieted soul, to see the hope of the gospel. Evangelism, evangelism is not necessarily presenting the full gospel and getting a decision every time. It can be that. If the Lord allows that, run into it. But often it's scattering the pebbles as you go, trusting God's sovereign work. As you're in the grocery store, the coffee shop, little conversations, little bits of love for people. Second, learn from Lieutenant Columbo. Greg Kokel has written an excellent book called Tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions, and I commend it to you. One of the methods he discusses, he calls the Columbo tactic. Now, I, I adore Columbo, and I'm afraid to ask how many of you know who Lieutenant Columbo is, so I won't, but he was a TV detective who wore a ruffled trench coat and messy hair, and he drove a beat-up car, and he seemed to not be the brightest bulb, um, but he was a genius. His unassuming manner made him non-threatening, and his Questions, though obnoxious, seemed harmless. I'm sorry, just one more question, he'd always say. The Colombo tactic for a Christian is, is merely asking questions. Questions that force a person to grapple with their ideas. The questions can lead them to the wrestling. It's a form of putting a pebble in their shoes, like Lieutenant Colombo. Third, live where you are. You don't need to be something you're not. If you love philosophy and physics and bio biology, then fine. Dive into apologetics, dive into the deep end, and try to reason with drowning sinners. If you like to argue and debate, then fine. Engage in those adversarial conversations. But if you're not or you don't, then just live your testimony. Your testimony and your knowledge of the gospel, they are sufficient for every situation the Lord puts you in. There is no relationship you have that is accidental. There is no place in your life that is accidental. The Lord has somebody for you. If someone continually throws up walls, you continually say, I'm not sure about that, but one thing I do know, though I was blind, now I see. And you show them the love of Christ. You tell them of the love of Christ. There are countless barriers the fallen heart will construct to deal with all the objections can be useless. The single best apologetic is simple. Come and see. Come and see what Jesus has done for me. Come and see what he says in his word. Invite people to read the Bible with you. Do one-to-one -one Bible reading for a limited time. Just see, they can see what it's all about. I think you'll be surprised how many will take you up on it. You do not need all the answers. You just need to love Jesus. And finally, pray. Remember that it is God who saves, not you. It is God that removes the dead heart and gives a new living heart, not you. It is God who is irresistible to the redeemed heart. He does the effective work in the midst of our obedient work. So we can have these conversations 
We can put pebbles in shoes. We can love our neighbors as Christ. We can proclaim the gospel all without fear. It does not depend on you, but it is for your joy to enter into it. Indeed, you are commanded to do so. It is surely a good work God has set before you. Remember Harry Markopoulos and Frank Casey, the ones who were sounding the alarm about Madoff? Well, at one point, Frank Casey asked his friend, There de la Villache, what if Harry and I are right about Bernie Madoff? And what if you're wrong? If Harry and I are correct and you are wrong, what happens to you? De la Villache responded, let me put it to you this way, Frank. I have all of my money in it. I have most of my family's money in it. I have every private banker that I have groomed as a relationship in it. And I probably have half of the royalty of Europe in it. I have no out if I am wrong. If you and Harry are correct and I am wrong, I am a dead man. And so it is with all those who who have invested their entire soul in the great fraud. They have no out but Jesus. Okay, let's close with verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. That salvation would come out of Zion. This brings us back to Psalm 2, where the psalmist says, let salvation come out of Zion, the abode of the anointed king. And saying, oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion, the psalmist is yearning for the anointed king, the king of kings. Well, salvation has come out of Zion. The king of kings, Jesus, reigns. And God is restoring the fortunes of his people. He is gathering from where they have scattered. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Brothers and sisters, let's go harvest. For the Lord has someone for you every day, if you will. Someone who crosses your path and is utterly lost. Whether you throw a pebble in their shoe or are blessed to fully unfold the glories of the gospel for them, what joy you will have when on that day you stand arm in arm before Jesus and proclaim with glorified vocal cords, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever, the King of kings. Let's pray.